Um, now I would like to pass it on to our Dean of Students, Jim Nyland, who is a, um, going to welcome you today and take it away, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, my thanks to everybody involved in the organization of this fabulous event, to uh, Ali, to the entire events and comms team. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Special thank you to our UNESQ elder in residence, uh, Uncle Wayne, uh, who was a gift to this university. Always interesting, always engaging, um, looking great for 73, I have to say, which is, is marvelous, um, and gets us off to a, a fabulous uh, start. So with those few thank yous uh, in mind, uh, let us begin. Provost, Deputy Vice-Chancellors, Pro-Vice-Chancellors, Presidents and Co-Presidents, Deans, Directors and Teaching Fellows, Registrars and Researchers, Professors, Principals, Practice Leads and Educators, Lecturers, Learning Advisors and Librarians, Chairs, co-chairs and coordinators, academics and professional staff, most importantly, our students. Can I welcome each and every one of you to this very special occasion, the 2023 Student Voice Australasia Symposium themed, Exploring Quiet Voices for Impact. And can I thank you for caring about the student voice in our cherished university sector. My name is Professor Jim Nyland, and I'm the Dean of Students here at UniSQ, who is very proud to be hosting this event. And I'm also privileged to be chair of the SVA Steering Committee. Nearly 200 participants join us today. A very special welcome to those of you who join us here at UniSQ's Springfield campus, and a warm welcome to those who join us online across Australia and New Zealand. You reach an age in life uh, when you think about the impact uh, that you have on your particular sector. It's normally an age when you have less years ahead of you than you have behind you, and one or two more gray hairs than you might like uh, to admit. And as I hurriedly scour around this room and look at colleagues online, I am hopeful that I'm not the only person who falls into that particular category. But if I was to for, um, project myself 20 years uh, ahead and look back uh, on the next two years facing us, I firmly believe that what we will achieve together through the Student Voice Australia will be momentous over this next two uh, years in putting the student voice front and center of our cherished sector. Part of the rationale for that is that much of the hard yard has been done uh, already by way of background SVA began as a pilot led by Professor Sally Varnum in 2019 uh, from the research conducted from her 2016 Australian National Senior Teaching Fellowship. This research sparked the development of a national framework for student partnership in university decision making and governance, the setup principles, along with toolkits and good practice guides. And I'm pleased to say that Sally joins us online today. After being developed and piloted at uh, the University of Technology in Sydney and spending the following three years housed at the University of Adelaide, we are proud to take over the SVA hosting duties here at UniSQ. This university was part of the original pilot project led by Pro Professor Karen Nelson, our provost, who joins us here this morning. Uh, under her leadership, UniSQ has developed our partnership framework and established a new system of student governance, including our Student Senate. So exciting times for us here at UniSQ with an A-team of university leaders putting students at the heart of everything we do. And in similar fashion, we hold great aspirations for SVA in the next two years with a focus on growth, strengthening the network through engagement and continuing to bring value to all of our members. For now, it's my great honor to introduce the newest member of the SVA Steering Group, the DVC Education of Griffith University, Professor Sean Ewan, to share his thoughts as we open today's proceedings. But just before I do, I will share with you that I did have the honor and privilege of working at the same institution uh, as Sean, albeit um, quite a bit before his time. In fact, 20 years ago when I came over to Australia, it was to uh, join the team at 
uh, Griffith University, uh, then led by Professor Glyn Davis. I'm not sure what Glyn's doing now. It's, I think it's some government job or something, maybe. <laughs> but um, but they were exciting times. Now, Glyn was only in that position as VC of Griffith for two years before he was headhunted by Melbourne University. But in that two years, it's interesting what has been developed. Uh, I came over from UK to help run the Office of Community Partnerships. That was uh, flagged in the Griffith Project, one of the key projects they wanted to uh, put in place. It's interesting that now flourishes as the Office of Engagement. Another key project there was the uh, Griffith Review, uh, which uh, this year uh, reaches its 81st edition uh, of Australian authors uh, and has made great headway in that time. Uh, and it created the IR uh, Association, the Association of Inno Innovative Research at Universities. Again, that's lasted the test of time, moving from five original members to seven uh, that they have today. The other thing it did was to rebrand um, Griffith University. Uh, and in all of that, uh, th those big achievements, uh, the student voice was paramount in those. The re rebranding is an interesting one because, of course, we know Griffith to be read. Uh, and Glyn would say it was the student voice uh, that really sort of um, made that the focus. And they said uh, in consultation uh, that if you're going to go red, go really red, red. So the intensity of Griffith's red is entirely down to the student voice. And since my time there, in the successive roles I've had, I've always taken that on board in terms of the student voice, whether it's creating a physical learning environment through a master planning process, uh, or whether it's creating a live curriculum as part of um, uh, course offerings in a university. I've always given the onus, not just the listening part, but the onus on the student partner and the student voice because you get better decisions and long lasting decisions that will last the ten test of time. And when I look back 20 years ago now, and I think about, about what was achieved in that two year period, it gives me great hope uh, and belief that uh, we can achieve marvelous things over the next two years through the student voice Australia Enterprise. Back to Sean, <laughs> uh, if I may. Um, I am personally thrilled that Sean has joined the SVA board. I have spent many years trying to attract Sean to other boards uh, without success, so I know he is really choosy, which is why I'm so delighted that he's joined SVA and is here with us this morning to open this symposium. Prior to working at Griffith, Sean held key leadership roles at the University of Melbourne and is renowned for his work in Indigenous health, as he played a pivotal role in the Leaders in Indigenous Medical Education, the Lyme Project, fostering collaboration among all medical schools in Australia and New Zealand. Professor Ewan is a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion in higher education, believing they are fundamental prerequisites for academic excellence. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Sean Ewan. Thanks, Jim. You're very kind and really had your coffee this morning. So, um, Uncle Wayne, thank you for your welcome. Uh, and I might make a few reflections on that, which is uh, from time to time, welcomes and acknowledgements, mostly acknowledgements actually of country really annoy me because they're not based in meaning and not connected with the purpose of the event. And in that spirit, they become a, an important but could be seen as tokenistic uh, expression of recognition. Uh, yours was very far from that and I know it was a welcome to country. So thank you for welcoming uh, me and us here. It's reminiscent of the 20 years that I lived on Narum, uh, Melbourne, uh, only Joy Murphy Wandon would always bring in uh, Managum, which was specific to the region, uh, and share that with us. So thank you for grounding us and connecting us to the place and to where we are, and I think that's uh, a critical to how we set the tone for the day. Uh, as Jim's mentioned, I'm uh, one of the newest members of the, I think the newest member of the uh, steering committee of this group, and it's, uh, I wasn't going to say anything about uh, saying no to Jim several times in the past, but uh, he brought it up, so... Uh, I, I think that this group uh, has a really important role to play. And I moved to Griffith about 18 months ago from the University of Melbourne, where I left, where I was pro-vice-chancellor 
place and Indigenous. So we led the Indigenous portfolio, but then started to think about what that meant for place. Um, and a, a couple of things around moving to Griffith is not about me. This is about institutions and, and student voice. There weren't many universities across Australia that I actually would have moved to. I'd done my time at Melbourne. There's nothing anti-Melbourne. Uh, I'd spend a wonderful year in 2020. We landed in London in the middle of January um, for a year long sabbatical, which was going to be Stockholm, Singapore, Vancouver. Uh, it ended up being the kitchen, the lounge room, the balcony. Um, and what was fascinating, uh, riffing on the theme of red, was that at the depths of the lockdown in uh, 2020 in London, uh, the buses, the red buses kept going around and around the city at exactly the same pace they would go if it was full of traffic, but there was no traffic. And it was like a weak uh, pulse, a weak heartbeat, just going and going and going. Um, the opportunity of... Uh, uh, the COVID for us was lots of time to read and to think and to reflect on uh, things like purpose of universities and the role of student voice. And I often reflected on a meeting that I had uh, at an unnamed institution where there are about uh, half a dozen of us in the ninth floor of a building talking about the international student experience. Firstly, we were all male and I note the gender uh, diversity at least, but uh, interesting imbalance in this room. Uh, we were all male. We all went to university last century and we were pontificating about the student experience. We were all locals. We were pontificating about the student experience for international students. And I was like, guys, we're dinosaurs. Uh, and I mean that genuinely, but uh, affectionately. Um, it was possibly career limiting. Um, because we have no lived experience of living in a, an overpriced shoebox size apartment in, I'll reveal the institution if I say where, but it might have been Carlton or Parkville. Um, and making decisions about how we support student experience. And I thought about that quite a lot uh, when I was in London as well. So I think for most of you, and I won't make a comment on Jim's hair gray or otherwise but for most of us most of our executives that that make decisions about what we're going to do in this space did actually go to university last century um i did although i don't look at so thank you for saying that Deanna. um and for me that's a really important part of, of thinking through what co-creation might look like and how we how we deeply engage uh with our students to craft an experience that is as much theirs as it, is, as it is ours. And the flip side of having a voice and developing a voice is listening. And I think a great skill uh, that we need to work at as part of the exec at unis is to think about how we listen to the student voice. Um, so just some kind of random thoughts. The only other thing I want to reflect on from what Jim said is, in, is that times do change quite quickly. When we established, it was Ian Anderson that established it, but then I led it after Ian went to Canberra. Um, the Leaders in Indigenous Medical Education Network. One of the aspirations of that network, and there's a conference uh, in a couple of weeks back in Canberra, was that we wanted to reach population parity for Indigenous medical students across the country. Parity with domestic students, not international. And we reached that, surprisingly, in about 2016-17. Um, that was in some ways unheard of, in fact, when we started the network in the early 2000s. The other example was um, uh, at Melbourne, we established from a, a very generous philanthropic gift, uh, the, uh, the Melbourne Poach Centre for Indigenous Health. And one of our aspirations when we started that, I think in 2015, 2016, was to have 20 new Indigenous PhD students by 2020. And they smashed that out of the water a couple of years before that. And when we set those targets, they were things we thought, oh, they're aspirational. We're not going to get there. Um, there's a uh, tsunami is the wrong word, but there's a very big and healthy wave of Indigenous students coming through uh, our universities now at all levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD. I think there's something like, I'm not up with the latest data, but 500 or so uh, Indigenous PhD candidates across the country. 
10 years ago, that was uh, was unheard of. And, and I reflect on those comments from my area, partly because change does come and it does happen. Uh, and you get there and you think, oh, shit, that's actually not a bad place to be. And you set those aspirations earlier. So I'm looking forward to seeing what um, this group uh, can do and the change that it can affect, which will come, if we work hard at it, will come quicker than we realise. Today's all about uh, ensuring that all voices are given a platform to be heard. And I'm really uh, looking forward to listening to the keynote from Lucy shortly. Um, how do we provide space for that to happen? Um, we have been designed, it has been designed with students and practitioners, practitioners in mind uh, as an opportunity to dive deeper into the question of how we enable diverse representation of student voices in higher ed. I note the time, but I've got just a couple of very other brief comments. Jim talked about my passion for diversity and equity you actually those things are actually a precursor and a precondition for excellence you cannot have excellence without having those things beforehand otherwise you have a very watered down narrow version of excellence which is probably a privileged groups version of excellence uh, publications in high-ranking journals which have publishers with this is done in the us so the names are uh, they, they define their categories don't ask me about them Names that came from different cultural contexts and backgrounds, uh, jointly on publications, were more highly cited, were better publications. Uh, and if you had people from around the world on the publication, it gets further and is read more and is a better publication. Just as one tangible example of thinking about uh, diversity and equity as a precursor to excellence. It's not a nice to have, it's a precondition and we need to think about what that actually looks like. So, Enough from me. We hope you feel empowered to uh, engage in the discussions, connect with others, share your thoughts and questions. I'm, as I said, I'm really looking forward to the next session and, and hearing about uh, different kinds of voices and are they silenced or are they not? Uh, we're kind of living in a bit of an Orwellian phase as well, so that will be interesting to think through um, from my perspective what those things look like. I'll now pass the final words over to Anna, who coordinates uh, SVA and uh, have some fabulous directions to get me here and on time, which is good, uh, and who led the Uni uh, Southern Queensland team to bring us together here today. So thank you. Thanks for the invitation, uh, and it'll be a good day.